called uh, um, the act of hope, the act of love, the act of contrition. And traditionally, all of these prayers uh, begin with, oh my God. Um, in fact, when I was in the uh, elementary school and learning these prayers, and there were a series of them, I always thought they were the oh my God prayers. But, they, um, <laughs> but they're all very beautiful, so I'm going to do uh, two of them tonight, uh, the act of hope and an act of love. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Let us pray. O oh my God, relying on your almighty power and infinite mercy and promises, I hope to obtain pardon for my sins, the help of your grace, and life everlasting through the merits of Jesus Christ, my Lord and Redeemer. And this is the act of love. O oh my God, I love you above all things, with my whole heart and soul because you are all good and worthy of all love. I love my neighbor as myself for the love of you. I forgive all who have injured me and I ask pardon of all whom I have injured. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Tonight's class, uh, we begin the study of the, the Ten Commandments. And um, we're going to do two tonight, actually, the first and the second. But before we get into the first and second, we're going to get into uh, the, the two uh, greatest commandments. Uh, and I'll be talking about that as well. I should preface this by saying um, that the Catholic Church in the 1960s went through uh, what was called a, a, a renewal period. <laughs> Um, that was a result of the Second Vatican Council when all the bishops of the world got together and, and looked at uh, how, as a church, we were relating to the world and how the world was relating to us. And there was a call for some updating, opening of windows, and uh, uh, bringing in fresh air into the church. When the windows were opened, however, uh, what came into the church was not a gentle breeze, uh, but a tornado. Uh, that turned everything upside down and there was a lot of confusion in the church, uh, especially between 1965 and 1979 when, uh, or 78 when Pope John Paul II was elected. So there was about a, a 13 to 14 year period of tremendous upheaval in the church. And in the process of updating and renewing, what we did, unfortunately, was to throw the baby out with the bathwater. So we didn't just purify ourselves, but we got rid of some things that we shouldn't have. And we're in the process of recovering those. But one of the things that prior to the Second Vatican Council that Catholics were very good at was having a sense of obligation a sense of commitment and the importance of making vows and promises and that the laws of God were extremely important and the most important of those laws were the Ten Commandments as well as uh, church law which is both uh, a combination of human and divine law. <clears throat> but Catholics took these things very very seriously. Well after the Second Vatican Council this idea came in that Catholics were too legalistic uh, and too rigid and they weren't very loving and, uh, and God is love and Jesus is love and uh, the Ten Commandments have corrupted our love and all you really need to do is follow the Beatitudes and, and, and then you'll have it all together. And so there was this contempt almost for the law in Christianity uh, or as the church handed it on. Now this just so happened to coincide with uh, what was going on in the 1960s in society in general. Does anybody know? What were we calling policemen? Pigs. Pigs, yes, okay. Uh, and there were protests and there were all kinds of things going on. So uh, unfortunately Vietnam was on and there were, you know, authority uh, figures were the bad guys and, 
and you know we want free love and marijuana and hold hands and sing kumbaya among other things and um, and so this whole thing of, of the law was tossed out the window uh, by our culture at that time uh, and this was almost a worldwide phenomenon that happened to coincide with a renewal that was going on in the church um, I don't know why the Holy Spirit picked that particular time, but it in some ways compromised what the authentic uh, renewal should have been. So I preface that by letting you know that some modern Catholics today that you might run into may be still flower children of the 1960s, but they're, now they're in my age and, and um, they're in their 60s and 70s and they're still flower children of the 1960s. Uh, so just be aware of that. So, but we're, we're getting over that period. As soon as all of us die off, uh, that period will be gone. <laughs> so, <laughs> we don't know when that'll occur, but anyway. But anyway, tonight uh, we want to speak about the commandments of God uh, which uh, God gave to Moses. Uh, and, and in the commandments uh, of the church, um, Jesus tells us, and I quote from St. Matthew, I have not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. And then again in Matthew, he says, Make disciples of all nations, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. So the commandments show us how we must live. The Ten Commandments were given by God to Moses. Our Lord handed on these commandments to his church and gave the church power to make new laws as time went on. And these new laws are what we call canon laws. They're not uh, necessarily uh, as high up on the hierarchy of laws as the, the Ten Commandments, but the church bases its own laws now, what we call canon law or church law, on the Ten Commandments. And the church has always seen um, the road to heaven as uh, a narrow path and the road to hell as a wide highway. And that many choose the wide highway rather than the narrow path that leads uh, to eternal life. But each commandment orders us to take the right road and forbids us to take the wrong road. Uh, the commandments guide us on the way. So that's why they're so important, all ten of these that we'll be um, speaking about for the next several weeks, because they are uh, God's acts of love, if you will, to show us how to remain on that path that, which is narrow uh, that leads to heaven. The religion of Christ is not just a body of truths to, believe, to be believed, as we believe the truths in a geography book. It is above all a way of life. It means that we become one with Christ, living his life, imitating his actions, and following the directions of his laws. So besides believing what God has revealed, there are other things that we must do to be saved. We must keep his law. So if you don't learn anything else tonight other than that, we must keep God's laws. That's not optional. Uh, it's, you know, there's a phenomenon in the Catholic Church, and I guess in all Christian churches, uh, of what we call cafeteria Catholicism or cafeteria Christianity. We pick and choose that which we like, and we leave that which we don't like. Uh, and that's not authentic faith. Uh, that's picking and choosing. It's like the person um, looking at uh, all the various religions of the world, deciding which one he's going to choose, depending upon uh, um, if it conforms to his idea of what religion should be. Uh, so, in other words, our, our faith tells us that, that we are to follow God uh, and his law and to follow all of them, not just those that we think are, are worthy of our participation. The two greatest commandments uh, that contain the whole law are these. First, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with your whole mind, and with your whole strength. And the second is, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So before we even get into the Ten Commandments, we have to focus in on those two greatest commandments, uh, the love of God and the love of, nature because, uh, of, of neighbor, because those two are 
the foundation of what flows uh, in the actual Ten Commandments. So if we don't know those two greatest commandments, then we're going to miss uh, why we have the other Ten Commandments to begin with. Love is the most important of the commandments. Our love must go first to God and then to all God's children, our brothers and sisters in Christ. And all the other commandments simply show us in detail how we are to love God and our neighbor. If you love me, keep my commandments. So even uh, in this presentation of the law, you see where love has to be the foundation because you could easily fall into an empty legalism and not understand that uh, following the law is meant to enable you to love better, uh, to love God better, first of all, and to love uh, neighbor better as well. So what must we do to love God, our neighbor, and ourselves? To love God, our neighbor, and ourselves, we must keep the commandments of God and of the church and perform spiritual and corporal works of mercy. So there's a, a recipe given to us. And if we learn this recipe, and they're usually very simple to learn, these can be guides for our lives. They can be like a, a mission statement for each of us uh, as Christians. The spiritual and corporal works of mercy are acts of love which will show to Christ in the membership of his mystical body that uh, will show Christ to others. Uh, whatever we do for a member of the body of Christ, we do for Christ. And we can help non-Catholics or non-Christians to become members of Christ's body by the love we show toward them. In fact, I think a lot of people who become uh, Catholic may have been influenced by somebody who gave them a positive witness of being uh, first of all committed to their faith and committed to uh, helping people and just being a good person. So which are the the chief corporal works of mercy? There are seven of them. To feed the hungry, to give drink to the thirsty, to clothe the naked, to visit the imprisoned, to shelter the homeless, to visit the sick, and to bury the dead. Now this is a, a recipe not only for each of us as individual Christians or individual Catholics, it's also a recipe of what the mission of a parish church should be, similar to St. Uh, Joseph's. As a church, we should be participating in all of these corporal works of mercy to feed the hungry. And I think we do that through uh, our food drive and uh, uh, collections that help those who are hungry. Uh, as well as giving drink to the thirsty. We, we clothe the naked. We find ways to do that. We visit people in prison. Uh, we give, try to give shelter to the homeless. Uh, Sister Elizabeth uh, is beginning a, a ministry to the downtown people called Daybreak to give them a place uh, during the day to come and relax and take a shower and read and, and feel like a human being rather than living out on the street all day. To visit the sick. As a parish, we do that. To bury the dead. I just had a funeral this morning. Uh, part of the corporal works of mercy. The corporal works of mercy are acts of love which come from the heart to help our neighbor in his bodily need. So all of these are very important, not just for the church collectively, but for all of us individually. But then there are the spiritual works of mercy. And these can be rather uh, challenging, and, this, and there are seven of those. The chief spiritual works of mercy are these. Number one, admonish the sinner. Now that's not just up to Father McDonald as a priest to do that. If you know someone who is participating in sin, uh, you have to admonish them. Uh, now, once you admonish them, you shouldn't harass them after that. Okay, hopefully, you know, they would, would, would take your words to heart and, and follow through on what you're saying. So, if your best buddy, who is married and has several children, is also having an adulterous affair, you should admonish him. Uh, or, if you know someone who uh, seems to be um, embezzling money from an organization that, that he belongs to, you should admonish that person. So there's a, that's a corporal work, of, that's a spiritual work of mercy. Secondly, 
You are to instruct the ignorant. Now we have some teachers in here so they know what I'm talking about. Uh, so <laughs> you are to instruct the ignorant. But, but this is more from the spiritual point of view. Of helping the ignorant, those who do not know, to know Christ and his truths. You know, there are a lot of people who think committing adultery is perfectly fine. There are a lot of modern young people today who think um, living together with their boyfriend or girlfriend is fine. In fact, they brag about it and they get mad at their parents when their parents don't uh, appreciate what they're doing. Um, there are a lot of people who think that they don't have to go to church on Sunday. So, but it's out of ignorance uh, because sometimes when you lead them to the truth, uh, they kind of come around and say, oh, I didn't know that. I didn't know that was there. I'm always amazed uh, at certain Catholics that I know who have very little education in the faith. They've never opened up a catechism and uh, they don't listen to the homily and sometimes the homilies that they hear don't give them any instruction. So they, they don't realize there are some demands that are being placed upon them as a follower of Christ. Number three, to counsel the doubtful. Now we all run into people who, who have doubts about the faith uh, and about God uh, or they go through a crisis like the death of a loved one. Uh, so it's up to all of us, not just the priest, to, to kind of counsel them, to help them through that uh, and to be with them in their doubt. To comfort the sorrowful, to bear wrongs patiently. Let's talk about that one. To bear wrongs patiently. How many of us have a persecution complex? Uh, it seems like people are always bothering me and not, you know, I'm not getting credit for what the church calls you or the, the spiritual works of mercy say bear wrongs patiently, forgive all inner injuries, and number seven, pray for the living and the dead. Now you know we do that during Mass, but you should be remembering not only those you love who are alive, but you should also be remembering those who are dead uh, in your family members. And I would say the ones that you should be praying the most for are the ones that you have the most difficulty with. Uh, even those who have died, <clears throat> to, to pray for their soul. Because there needs to be a, a reconciliation, doesn't there, of some kind. So the spiritual works of, of mercy are acts of love toward our neighbor to help him in the needs of his soul. And since the soul is far more important than the body, the spiritual works of mercy are far more important than the corporal works of mercy. Now that kind of goes against the world, doesn't it? Uh, we seem to think that the material things that we give to people are far more important than the spiritual things, so we let the spiritual things slide by the wayside, but we're all gung-ho about helping the poor and, and doing this, that, and all the other, which is good, but also the spiritual works of mercy are, are very, very important. The question is, is everyone obliged to perform the works of mercy? Yes, <laughs> the, the, the answer to that is very uh, clear. Everyone is obliged to perform the works of mercy according to his ability and the need of his neighbor. So, you know, there's some things that you can't help people with and because you don't have, you're not equipped with the skills, so to speak. So, if, you know, if somebody comes to you and um, <clears throat> needs to be counseled, you might feel like, I, I, I really can't help you in this. I'm not sure how to direct you correctly, but let me refer you to someone. Um, or let's say that somebody has a, a very deep question about the faith and you don't know how to look it up, direct them to somebody else. So you, it's important that everyone do it, but according to their own ability. The ordinary deeds done every day to relieve the corporal and spiritual needs of others are true works of mercy. Uh, and they help others. And doing them in the name of Christ means doing them for the love of Christ. It is really loving him in the members of his mystical body. He himself has said, all of these actions done to help others is as though you were doing it for me. Uh, and that's uh, in, in um, St. Matthew. And it's also true that in the parable of the separation of the sheep and the goat, uh, uh, you know, Jesus says to the ones that on his left, uh, uh, I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, you gave me nothing to drink. I was sick and in prison and you did not visit me. And they'll say, well, when did we do that? Uh, and it was uh, when you didn't take care of the least of my brothers and sisters. 
And then he goes to the ones on his right and says, come into my kingdom because when I was sick and all, you did this, that, and the other. And they say, well, when did we do that? When you took care of the least of my brothers and sisters. So that's all part of the corporal and spiritual works of mercy. So that brings us to the Ten Commandments. <clears throat> you should know, those of you who come from uh, Protestant traditions, that the Catholic Ten Commandments, as we highlight them traditionally, uh, are slightly different than the Protestant version, version of the Ten Commandments. I think uh, what the Protestant ones do is they combine Commandments 1 and 2, uh, um, and then they have the second commandment, thou shalt not have any graven images. How many of you are aware of that? Okay. Well, we don't have that. And we know that it's in the scriptures, but it's not part of our traditional Ten Commandments, thou shalt not have graven images. Rather, we, we uh, separate the traditional first commandment into two commandments uh, the, of the Protestant uh, tradition. Uh, and we say, uh, you shall not take the name of the, your, the Lord your God in vain, and you should... Um, uh, I'm sorry, you shall not have any strange gods before me, and thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. So let me go over our Ten Commandments, which have a longer tradition than the Protestant Ten Commandments. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, you know, there's, there's a lot of, of flexibility uh, because, you know, the Ten, ten Commandments are, come from uh, um, the book of Deuteronomy, is that correct? And, and it's so it just depends on how you lump them together, and the Catholic Church has lumped them together in this traditional form. Number one, I am the Lord thy God, thou shalt not have strange gods before me. Number two, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Number three, remember to keep holy the Lord's day. Now technically that should be the Sabbath but we, uh, uh, in the Old Testament, but for us the Sabbath as Christians is, is Sunday, the Lord's Day. Number four, honor thy father and thy mother. Number five, thou shalt not kill. Number six, thou shalt not commit adultery. Now number six uh, in the Catholic Church, uh, what, is, what is thou shalt not commit adultery? What number is it in the Protestant Church? Is it six as well? Right, I left that out, but I combined one and two. So uh, you combined one and two, and then had uh, so. So when when a Catholic says don't break the sixth commandment, you're probably thinking of a different commandment <laughs> than Catholics are thinking. We think of adultery, and you're thinking um, what? <laughs> you're thinking don't steal. Okay, <laughs> so, okay. So it's, so it's, so it's important to know the numbers and and that there's a slight difference. Okay. Number seven is, uh, the commandment seven is, thou shalt not steal. Number eight, thou shalt not bear false witness against your neighbor. Number nine, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife. Number ten, you shall not cover, covet your neighbor's goods. So tonight we're going to be speaking specifically about one and two. Now the question is, should we be, merely, uh, should we be satisfied merely to be keeping uh, the commandments of God? No. As important as they are, we should not be satisfied merely to keep the commandments of God, but should always be ready to do good deeds even, even when they're not commanded. Okay? Uh, and keep in mind that when we're speaking about the commandments in particular, we're speaking about this is the least you could do as a follower of Christ. The least you could do is not uh, take the name of the Lord your God in vain. The least you can do is not have any false gods. The least you can do is honor your father and mother. The least you can do is not kill your uh, uh, neighbor. The least you can do is not seal. So, so this is the foundation, which is the minimal requirement. Anytime you look at law, it's always the minimal requirement. Jesus teaches us to go beyond the law and to do the most we can do rather than the least we can do. Which also means then looking at what we have failed to do uh, as well as what we have done. Uh, so that's always an important uh, point in examining uh, one's conscience. Real love never says enough. It always tries to do all it can for the one it loves. Not just so much, and not no, not just so much, and no more. So, for example, you know, if you're married, and 
Um, well, let's say there, there, are many, there are many Catholics who only go to church uh, twice a year, at right? Christmas and Easter, okay? And they say they love God. But I wonder how uh, um, a husband who says he loves his wife says, well, I'll only visit with you uh, at Christmas and Easter. Uh, the rest of the time you're on your own. Would that be love? No, there's something wrong with that. There's something corrupt with that. You, there, there, there needs to be uh, a going beyond that. So what our Savior uh, recommends is that um, is not strictly uh, commanded by the law. What does our Savior especially recommend that is not strictly commanded by the law of God? Jesus especially recommends the observance of the evangelical counsels. Voluntary poverty, perpetual chastity, and perfect obedience according to your state in life. Let me repeat those. The, the three evangelical counsels are voluntary poverty, perpetual chastity, and perfect obedience depending on your state in life. So for a, a married person or a person who's not a priest or a nun or, or a monk, uh, there would be a different way of experiencing that. By voluntary poverty we mean that we don't make possessions the center of our lives or we hoard things uh, and forget about the needs of others that that we try to live simple lives now I don't know if it's just my imagination or not but it seems to me that more and more people are hoarding things than they used to uh, and we have all these storage facilities popping up all over the place for people who have so much stuff that they can't keep it in the house and they don't know what to do with it, so instead of giving it away, they put it in their storage facility and then they go visit it maybe at Christmas and Easter. Uh, <laughs> Pardon? Oh, I see, they're saving for antique dealers, okay. But I'm also noticing, like in, in Augusta, in my mother's neighborhood, when I drive through her neighborhood, I see lots of houses that have all kinds of junk outside in the carport. The car, you can't get a car uh, in there and it's just packed with stuff. I don't know why, um, but people seem to be hoarding things uh, more today than, than they, and it, you know, there is a sickness if you watch that TV show Hoarders. Now that's, that's the pathology obviously, but, but there's something that's causing us to, to want to hold on to things and evangelical poverty um, uh, or voluntary poverty means you own things, but they don't own you. And you don't attach to them a significance that they don't deserve. Okay, uh, so you're able to let go of things, even things that might have a nostalgic value to you. Uh, my mother has never been a hoarder, and she never, as growing up, I don't think there's anything in the house now, and she's 92 years old, that was in the house when I was uh, a teenager. There's, it's just totally different stuff. She's always getting rid of stuff. Uh, and there's no junk in the house. Um, but I think that comes from a time during World War II when she was in Italy as a young adult and they lost everything. Uh, and so when you go through that and, and you have nothing whatsoever, uh, then you begin to realize, well, you know, possessions uh, don't own me, I own them. So that's part of uh, voluntary uh, poverty. Perpetual chastity, according to your state and life means uh, for those who are single, abstinence from genital uh, sexuality. Now, it doesn't mean that you become a, a hermit but, and, and don't relate to people, but you, you are chaste. Within marriage, it means that you are exclusive with your spouse. Uh, it doesn't mean that you're not having sexual intercourse, but that you are chaste in the sense of your, your <coughs> focus is on your spouse. Now, I've been told that sometimes when spouses are in their marital act that one or the other might be thinking of somebody else uh, during that period of time. That's unchaste, okay? So, so you know, those are the, the, when we speak of chastity uh, within uh, your state and life, that's what we're talking about. Uh, and wasn't it Jimmy Carter who said that uh, in that Playboy interview in the 1970s, uh, he lusted and that was like committing adultery uh, even though he never actually did it. Well, there was some virtue or, or some merit to uh, uh, what he said there. So that's very important. And then uh, obedience means obedience to God. Obedience to what the church teaches in the areas of faith, morals, and church law as well as uh, the Ten Commandments. 
doesn't mean blind obedience to a particular individual in the church. So that has to be made clear. You know, you have to approach obedience from, from an adult perspective and, and that you don't owe obedience to a particular person, but you, obe you do owe obedience to God and His revealed truths. Uh, but that has to be done freely. No one can force you to do that. Does that make sense? Uh, because you, you, God respects your free will, so you have some leeway to commit sin and separate yourself from God if you wish. Uh, so we can't enforce Christianity on people, maybe our children, but uh, until they're out of the house. But, uh, but, but that's, you know, we have to be respecters of, of who people are and of their human dignity. So, so it's all about following uh, the Lord uh, in these various different ways. So I wanted to, to do that as a, a prelude to uh, our chapter now on the first commandment, which I want to talk about. The first commandment, of course, is, I am the Lord your God, you shall not have strange gods before me. By the first commandment, we are commanded to offer to God alone the supreme worship that is due to him. That's very important. We owe God and God alone supreme worship. Each of the Ten Commandments shows us how to love God and our neighbor. But the first commandment tells us to give God the reverence and adoration he deserves as the supreme being. It is sinful to set up some creature as the chief object of our worship or be as the chief source of our happiness, or C, as the chief teacher of truth, or D, as the chief moral guide. These make a God out of something creative. Now, what would be um, uh, setting up a creature as our chief object of worship? What, what would that be an example of that? A creature, no, no not, not, uh, not an object, but a creature. Pardon? A dog, okay. Let's say my dog is more important to me than anything else in the world. And there are some people, my mother has a cat, she's just like that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, don't send her this. Um, yes? I don't, I don't know if this is right, so I could be um, stereotyping, but um, isn't the Hindu religion like put cows very similar? Yes, yes. Uh, they, uh, I think. Uh, I, not real sure about all of, of that, but I'm thinking more from our perspective. What can we do? How about you know teenagers who fall head over heels in love with someone, and that someone has such control over them, and they offer them such adoration that you can tell that there's something sick here. There's something wrong with this. Okay, uh, so sometimes we can make other people uh, our false god, if you will, and I think that's the danger for for most of us. Right, there could be what we call the cult of the personality that, that in the Catholic Church we always tell people priests come and go but God remains the same. You know, it's, you know, no matter how many different priests you have in a parish uh, and they may come and go, you might like some better than others, but what remains constant is our Lord. Uh, so if you put too much into the priest, uh, and we all know people who leave churches or parishes or church and go to other places because their favorite priest is gone. Uh, well, we did that. Mm -hmm. We was coming up. We left the Baptist church because the priest was kicked out, and we followed him at least three churches. Yeah, that happens. People follow these like they're gurus. That could be like a false god. Yes. I was going to say, my daughter went to Japan. I one year as an exchange student, and the family wanted the girls, the girls, to make a meal for them. So they went out to the market and picked what they wanted to bring in. For Mandy chose uh, to have uh, uh, chicken, and uh, lo and behold, when they started eating, Mandy says, why isn't your dad eating? That's his God. <laughs> mm-hmm. Interesting. <laughs> but that happens. We, we set up these false gods. Um, B is... The chief, uh, we set up somebody as the chief, or something as the chief source of our happiness. That would be obviously money or, or material possessions or, or the pleasure that, that we get in life from illicit uh, drinking or drugs or, or sex or whatever. That becomes the chief uh, source of our happiness. In fact, 
we're not going to get into this tonight. You know, the biggest uh, part of what President Obama is trying to do in terms of forcing the Catholic Church to provide insurance for people to have uh, artificial contraception, sterilizations, and abortifacients, uh, which most people don't understand. It's First of all, the biggest problem is not that those things in particular, but that the state is forcing the Catholic Church to do something that goes against our moral principles. That's the biggest issue. But the second issue is natural law, uh, that we can't interfere with God's design of things and that when you change human sexuality by using birth control, artificial birth control, uh, what you're doing is you're eliminating the procreative aspect of the marital act, which is the reason why it's pleasurable. Uh, now the reason why it's pleasurable is also to nourish the love of a husband and wife, so that is good. Uh, <clears throat> but it's also so that you will beget children. And that if you eliminate the procreative aspect of sex within marriage, or even outside of marriage, uh, the Pope, Paul VI, felt that men would start to lose respect for women and use them as a, a sex object, to use them like a drug, you know what I mean, for their own pleasure. Uh, Pope Paul VI, I don't think, anticipated that women would do the same thing. And once they started using artificial contraception, they would use men as a drug uh, for their own personal pleasure. Uh, uh, and then all of a sudden, sex becomes a... Um, uh, becomes a what? Addiction. An addiction or, I was saying, like a, a gymnastic sport. I mean, it's, <laughs> you know... <laughs> Right. Because they're addicted to sex. They're, right. It's part of the, they're addicted to pleasure. And that's the false god, whether it's drugs or sex or whatever it is, because they abuse it. They don't understand what it's about uh, uh, from the perspective of God and from natural law. And that's the genius of the Catholic Church is that we're saying natural law. Stupid. That's what we're talking about, natural law. Okay. Uh, and, and, and when we push that off to the side and get rid of it, then all these other problems start uh, creeping in. Anyway, I got off topic here. Um, and then, you know, we might follow false, false gods in terms of moral guides. Now, I would say the, the false god today for moral guides is the mass media and television shows in particular. How many of you all love the TV show Friends? Do you remember that? It's old now. I hate it. Uh, but a lot of people like Friends. Um, but it was all about, you know, messing around the whole time. I mean, they were funny, but that was the seduction of it, because it was funny. You thought, well, gosh, these people are really cool, and I wish my life was like that. And you think, gosh, this is a bunch of dysfunctional people here that are in trouble all the time. Um, but most of the, the comedies today in particular um, really are seductive and are forming the conscience of people, and then they try to imitate the characters uh, and their lifestyle. So that's a, a, a false God. So how do we worship God, the true God? We worship God by acts of faith, hope, and charity, by adoring Him and praying to Him. Faith obliges us first to make efforts to find out what God has revealed, so it's up to us to do that, and second, to believe firmly what God has revealed, and thirdly, to profess our faith openly whenever necessary. And I think we're living in a culture today, in our society today, that it's important to profess our faith openly. Especially when we might be quizzed about, you know, the Catholics have been in the news recently, have you noticed? Uh, so, uh, with this Obama thing, and also with uh, Rick Santorum, who is not afraid to uh, live, speak about his Catholic faith, uh, even though it could cause him the, to lose the election. But that's not important to him. His Catholic faith, I mean, I think he wants to be president, but his Catholic faith and speaking about it is important to him. This is unusual for Catholics to have a Catholic po po uh, politician who's willing to do this. I mean, usually we have Catholic politicians who are just doing the opposite, you know, hiding their faith and, and speaking against it and, and saying, well, it won't interfere with the way I govern. Uh, Santorum is, is saying, this is what I believe and it guides my life and, and the press is freaking out, you know. He believes in Satan uh, and, uh, you know, so... <laughs> 
But that's what we're called to do as Catholics. Uh, now, I'm sure he's a politician, and, and there are some dark sides to every politician. To get elected, you have to sell your soul in one way or the other. But he seems to be... <laughs> he seems to be... Uh, uh, witnessing to our Catholic faith and, and us Catholics who would like to see him uh, get elected are saying, tone it down, you're not going to get elected if you're too Catholic, you know, people are going to freak out. Uh, so, but we're called to uh, witness to our faith, uh, to profess it openly, especially when necessary, and t t today it's all the more necessary. So the love of God will make us want to find out what God has told us about himself, it will make us want to be with him in heaven, which is important, and to know more and more about the way which leads there. Since we are on the way to God during all of our time here on earth, love will make us always study how we can advance more surely and rapidly toward him. We begin this study in school, but we must also continue it throughout our lives by reading and learning about what God uh, is who God is and the things of God. And I, I would say that, you know, one of the weaknesses of Catholics is that they, Catholic children in particular, they think that once they get confirmed in the eighth grade or ninth grade, they graduate. There's nothing more to learn. So they enter life and they grow in all the other areas of their life, whether it's the profession that they choose or, or whatever it is that they like. But they still, re and, you know, and they're mature in those areas, but in terms of the faith, they're still eighth graders although they might be in their 50s, because they haven't continued to learn. So it's, it's important that, that we continue to learn throughout our lives. The love of God will make it easier to believe firmly what God has revealed. Love is the living of what we believe. Living our faith gives us an unshakable conviction that it is true. To be convicted, have a conviction that what we believe as Catholics is actually true. And the love of God will give us the desire and the courage to profess our faith openly whenever there is a need, and even to die for it if the occasion arises. Now, I've, had, I've been in discussion with some people about this health mandate that President Obama is foisting upon the Catholic Church, and, and that really for the first time in American history, uh, uh, the pres a sitting president of the United States and the executive branch of government is uh, trying to manipulate uh, Christianity and the Catholic Church in particular and to define through a government measure what our mission and identity will be. Now, I don't know about you, uh, as I mentioned in the homily earlier, I'm an immigrant and my mother is Italian, she's 92, she was in her 20s when World War II broke out. She knew about Mussolini, she knew about fascism, and she knew about Hitler. And that all of them took power by incrementally intruding into uh, um, the working of religion and freedom of conscience and and seducing people into thinking what they were doing was good when in fact it was evil. I don't know if we're there yet, uh, but we may be on that slippery slope where Christians will have to witness to their faith in ways, in this country, in ways that they never, that we never thought we would have to. For example, when I was preaching years ago or you know you know we talk about the martyrs of the faith it was always these people in far off lands and ages ago who had to give up their faith because the pagans were trying to make them do things that they weren't supposed to do and and thank goodness we lived here in America where that didn't occur and now we may be living here in America where it is occurring because if the bishops of the United States say they won't follow a mandate that is law what will happen to them the church might get fined, okay? And then they say, well, we're not going to pay it. Then what's going to happen to the bishop who says he's not going to pay this fine nor the, 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 provide the, the insurance that they want us to provide for? He's going to be put in jail. Isn't that interesting? In the United States of America, that could happen. Because, not because he's broken any moral law of the church, uh, which is also a crime, but because he is following the moral law of the church. He's being put into prison. 
in the United States of America. So, what does hope oblige us to do? Hope obliges us to trust firmly that God will give us eternal life and the means to obtain it. Love of God will give us the confidence we need in God's faithfulness to his promises. He has promised us heaven and all the helps for body and soul that we need to get there. For our soul, we need sanctifying and actual graces, the virtues, which are faith, hope, and love, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, of which there are seven, the sacraments of which there are seven. And for our body, we need food, clothing, shelter, medical care. And if we love God, we shall understand his loving care of us, and that we shall trust firmly that his love will never leave us without the things we need to serve him. And that's why the um, corporal works of mercy and the spiritual works of mercy are so important because it brings body and spirit together into a whole. And that's what God is trying to do to save us uh, as a, a complete uh, being. Um, I was thinking about what I was just saying about martyr, being martyred and Cardinal George, who's the Archbishop of Chicago, said it, and I'm trying to remember exactly how he said it. He said, as a cardinal or archbishop in the Catholic Church today, he fully believes that he will um, die in bed, but he thinks the next bishop might be thrown into prison and that the bishop after him will be killed for his faith. And those are the, the, the stages that he thinks we're heading uh, in, in America. Uh, uh, so there's a lot of uh, our bishops, I've never seen them as alarmed about what's happening on the governmental level uh, as they are today. Uh, and, and hopefully it's galvanizing them to work together and then galvanizing the rest of us to work together. So, what does charity oblige us to do? Charity obliges us to love God above all things because he is infinitely good and to love our neighbor as ourself for the love of God. How can a Catholic best safeguard faith, his faith, his own personal faith? A Catholic can best save, safeguard his faith by making frequent acts of faith, like the prayer I just made, by praying for uh, a strong faith, by studying his religion very earnestly, by living a good life, by good reading, by refusing to associate with the enemies of the church, <laughs> and by not reading books and papers opposed to the church or her teachings. Now, I would say, if you're mature, you need to know what <laughs> others are saying, okay? Uh, so I'm not saying, you know, you don't read these things, oh, this is the truth, and, but you read them to critique it and to know what the enemy is thinking. Uh, you might associate with the enemy to know what he's thinking and uh, so I think in an earlier period the church uh, was afraid that, that if you did these things you would be seduced by them and sometimes we are like these television shows that I'm talking about uh, but sometimes you have to make a, a decision that so and so cannot be my friend because so and so has such a, a, an influence over me that I don't live my Catholic faith because of this person so you have to separate yourself from him do you understand what I'm saying uh, and that happens uh, occasionally. So how does a Catholic sin against the faith? Catholic sin, Catholic sin, a Catholic sins against the faith by apostasy, heresy, indifferentism, and by identifying himself with other religions. Now apostasy means completely leaving the faith of Christ to profess a non-Christian religion or none at all. That's what apostasy is. So when you leave the church altogether, that's a deadly sin. Heresy is a deliberate denial of one or more of the truths of the faith by one who professes to be a Christian. Indifferentism is belief that one religion is as good as another. These sins hurt God deeply. They offend him. Apostasy and heresy show a refusal to believe what he has told us. And indifferentism would put the mystical body of Christ on the same footing as a false religious system. So why does the Catholic, uh, why does a Catholic sin against faith by identifying himself with other religions? A Catholic sins against the faith by identifying himself with other religions because the one true religion is the Catholic faith. And to knowingly embrace practices or beliefs contrary to the faith is to abandon the truth of Christ. Now how can we do that? 
what would be some examples where a Catholic might embrace some elements of, of non-Christian uh, religions? Abandoned church. Well, apart from abandoned church, I mean, uh, but the, they would still say that they're Christian, but they they pull in some other aspects. Yes. Maybe a devotion to the astrology business. The astrology business, which would probably go against. Uh, 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 the, the second command we're, that we're talking about, uh, reading palms, uh, Ouija boards, uh, um, or, now this is controversial because I've seen some Catholic churches that have uh, opportunities for people to do this. Yoga. Isn't yoga... Uh, it's, it, it, right, so you're bringing in a spirituality into the Catholic faith that really is not a part of the Catholic faith. Not that it, yoga in and of itself is, is wrong, but it's, it's, it's of a, 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 a different religion that we would consider not to be the true religion. So it would be things like that. Um, yes? Um, okay, like, on my Catholic path, I'm very much alone. Like, my friends and my family are not Catholic. Yes. Now, they're very supportive of me, and they're glad to see me grow, and, and they're very kind about it. But let's say, in the meantime, my best girlfriend gets all involved in a Protestant church or Judaism or whatever, wouldn't it be merciful and loving for me to support her? So if she has her um, bar mitzvah or whatever. No, no, I think you can do that. Uh, um, you don't want to proselytize people. So we're, we're Catholics are not proselytizers. But we do, I would say if your best friend is a Catholic and then starting to do these things, then you should kind of maybe say, no, this isn't the way to, to go. Or I would not support somebody who is a Catholic who chooses... Um, to do something that breaks communion with the church. Well, if you do that then, can you say, gosh, I'm really concerned and I'm worried about yes. not the path for you, yes. but then still be loving? And right, right. I don't think you should abandon people unless they start to have a, 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 a negative influence on upon you. It, right. So, for, for example, for parents who have children who leave the faith or do things, you make it clear to them that you're displeased with this, but you love them nonetheless. Okay, you don't abandon them or isolate them or, or stop speaking to them. Uh, all the more, because you love them, you would want to have a positive influence on them, and maybe that would bring them a, a back around. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, yeah, so you know what I'm talking about. So, but you have to, right? Now, I, I can, but there was a time in the church years ago, in the 50s and 60s, where if you had a child getting married outside the church, you just didn't relate to them anymore. It was like they were dead. But that... <laughs> seems to sin against the, the two greatest commandments, love of God and neighbor, right? So, so there's got to be a middle road in all of this. Uh, yes? I love the yoga, because I practiced, uh, I practiced yoga when I was pregnant to relax because I'm not sure what. I have practiced yoga when I went to get my divorce, when I was at end, so I can't relax because I was very nervous. When I did yoga, I didn't contact all the spirit, anything. It just started to relax and I learned to relax myself. Uh, so, it's a breathing exercise, yeah, 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 and it's a stretching thing too, yeah, yeah. So it's exercise, except it's pagan and you're going to hell. No, I just. <laughs> right, right. I, I think it depends, you know. Um, it depends. Yeah. I think the yoga is you're emptying. You're emptying of yourself, but who comes in? But you know, in the 60s, uh, there was, apart from yoga, there was a, a push for transcendental meditation and all that kind of stuff. That's, that's a little bit more uh, uh, serious, I think. Oh, so there is Catholic yoga. Okay, okay, okay. So now you're, you're absolved, you won't go to hell anymore. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. okay. <laughs> Reiki, uh, Reiki, uh, right, I don't know, there's lots of things that I don't, I don't know uh, what they're all. But anyway, okay. What are sins against hope? The sin against hope, the sins against hope are presumption and despair. A person sins by presumption when he trusts that he can be saved by his own efforts without God's help or by God's help without his efforts. So the sin of presumption is, 
okay, I'm going to go commit adultery uh, tonight and I'll go to confession tomorrow and I'll be forgiven. And then the day after tomorrow I'll commit adultery and the day after that I'll go to confession and I'll be forgiven. That's the sin of presumption. That, that there's no demand on me to, to, to either re repent and try to reform my life. That no matter what I do, God loves me so much, he will forgive me. That's the sin of pres presumption. Um, so, or it would be uh, an example of that would be a man who prays very little because he does not see the need of asking God for help. Um, or the second type would be a man who would commit a mortal sin, presuming that God would give him the grace to go to confession, but God might not. Okay. So when does a, a person sin by despair? A, a person just sins by despair by deliberately refusing to trust that God will give him the necessary help to save his soul. So it's usually about your salvation. And so, you know, Catholics have a tendency to despair about their salvation. And I think it was because uh, when we were small, and if you're my age, and um, Sister Mary Edward in the second grade said, if you eat a hot dog on Friday, you're going directly to hell if you die. Uh, you think, okay, if a hot dog is going to send me to hell, she doesn't know the half of it. I mean, I'm, I'm never going to get into, into, into heaven, you know. So, so there was, a, you know, there's always a little bit of a, 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 an anxiety in Catholics that, you know, God is just lurking out there waiting for us to eat the hot dog and we're going to go to hell. Um, so that's the sin of despair. Uh, but there are a lot of people that do despair of their salvation uh, because they don't really trust God uh, or believe that he loves them and they feel like they always have to do something uh, to get God to please them uh, or to, to, to get God to love him. Uh, or to be pleasing to God. So, you know, that, sometimes that can be a psychological issue more than a, a sin, but despair can be a sin. So, uh, for example, um, despair would be a man who commits sins in business to make more money because he refuses to trust God, uh, that God would help him to provide for his family. God is offended when we refuse to trust in his love. What are the sins against charity? The chief sins against charity are hatred of God and of our neighbor, envy, sloth, which is laziness in the spiritual life, as well as scandal. And besides the sins against faith, hope, and charity, what other sins uh, does the first commandment forbid? It forbids uh, also superstition and sacrilege. By superstition, uh, that means when we attribute to a creature, a creature, a power that belongs to God alone. Uh, as when he makes use of charms or spells or believes in dreams or fortune telling or goes to spiritists. Even party games such as reading palms, tea leaves, the Ouija board are dangerous and at times could be sinful. What does a person do by a sacrilege? A sacrilege is when a person mistreats sacred persons, places or things. Uh, uh, like the, 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 the host uh, at communion time that you would treat that in an inappropriate way which is our Lord that's a blasphemy as well as a terrible uh, sacrilege okay now I'm going pretty long tonight that's just the first commandment okay <laughs> now commandment two um, let me see where are we at here yes oh you're changing well, that's why I said it could be a sin. Well, on the other hand, if my children see me do that and they don't know I know it's silly, they could actually be seduced by it. Yeah. Right, it could influence yeah. them to think that if I approve it. I think anytime you, you mess with the occult, you're asking for trouble. Well, I don't do that. Yeah. I, just, yeah. I was just wondering. Mm -hmm. I, I was a teenager. Are, are we ready to go? Oh, we're good here. Okay, we're back. Okay. The second commandment of God is, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. What we are commanded to do by the second commandment is uh, we are commanded always to speak with reverence of God, of the saints, and of holy things, and to be truthful in taking oaths and faithful to them and to our vows. So what is an oath? An oath is the calling on God to witness the truths of what we say. Uh, for example, when we say, so help me God, or honest to God, or by God. Many do not mean these as oaths, but that's what we're saying. Honest to God, I caught the biggest fish in the world. Okay. <laughs> so help me God, I'm going to get even with you. 
<laughs> okay. Uh, these are our, our sins against the second commandment of not taking the name of the Lord our God in vain. So what things are necessary to make an, make an oath lawful, for, for it to be lawful? To make, <coughs> excuse me, to make an oath lawful, first we must have a good reason for taking an oath. Second, we must be convinced that what we say under oath is true. And third, we must not swear, that is, take an oath to do what is wrong. The great sin uh, that a person commits uh, who uh, calls on God to bear witness to a lie, that's a very serious sin, uh, when you call on God to bear witness to a lie. <coughs> a person who deliberately calls on God to bear witness to a lie commits a very serious sin of perjury. A vow is a deliberate promise made to God by which a person binds himself under pain of sin to do something that is especially pleasing to God. What does it mean to take God's name in vain? By taking God's name in vain, it is meant that the name of God or the holy name of Jesus Christ is used without reverence, for example, to express surprise or anger. How many of us do that? We all do it, you know. Uh, it will, you know and sometimes it's, it's almost, it's not intentional, it just comes out. Oh God, uh, what does OMG mean? Oh my God, I mean, you know, <laughs> but it's not a prayer, it's just a, a, a kind of a, a, an unthinking way of using the, the name of God, and that's taking, that's breaking the second commandment. A name is a word picture of a person. Saying God's name is like using a picture of God. We should use it often, but always with reverence and love. To use a name without the proper reverence is to offend the person whose name we are using. Now, the, an interesting thing happened a couple of Sundays ago. I was filling in at St. Peter Claver and I was giving the homily, and before the Mass began, the uh, um, microphone wasn't working right. They had somebody to announce the hymn and, and say some words, and I couldn't hear them at the back of the church, so the deacon went and did something as we came in to repair it. <coughs> and there's this old joke uh, that I may, may have told you is this priest uh, realizes when he, and I'm telling this to the congregation, uh, the priest realizes that the microphone isn't working as he makes the sign of the cross at the beginning of Mass. And the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and he says, he's you know, hitting his microphone, and he says, there's something wrong with this microphone. And the congregation responds, and also with you. <laughs> <laughs> but today we have to say, uh, there's something wrong with this microphone. That's even worse, isn't it? I mean, it is, you know. <laughs> and, it, and it brought home to me how much better saying and with your spirit is during Mass because it's more offensive for someone to say there's something wrong with your spirit, right? <laughs> Whether, I mean, they can say there's something wrong with you, but when they say there's something wrong with your spirit, that's sacred ground you're on. So, uh, uh, so you know, that's just uh, one thought. Okay. Okay. Um, but I thought that gave a new meaning to that little joke there. Um, so it is a sin to take God's name in vain. Ordinarily, it is a venial sin. Okay, ordinarily. Um, now by that, it means that sometimes we take God's name in vain unthinkingly. It's serious to do that, and to do it willfully and with full intent is a mortal sin. But so often we say it in moments of anger or surprise or or enthusiasm, we say it in an unthinking way, so that, that lessens the culpability of the sin. What is cursing? Cursing is the calling down of some evil on a person, place, or thing. To wish that someone would lose his soul or would suffer some bodily harm is against the love we owe to our neighbor. What is blasphemy? Blasphemy is insulting language which expresses contempt for God either directly or through his saints and holy things. For example, one business, businessman said he would give a framed picture of the second beatitude to the first meek man who ever made good, who ever did good. Uh, that's uh, blasphemy. You know, sometimes we, we uh, make fun of people who are meek and mild or uh, who seem to be religious. Even 
uh, how the press is going after Santorum in terms of his Catholic faith. It's, 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 it's like a, a blasphemy uh, uh, that they would do that. So, so the second commandment is all about honoring God and the first and second commandment really are related. Now what we don't have is graven images that so many Protestants were uh, growing up with. Uh, thou shalt not have any graven images. And that was directed to the Old Testament people uh, that they should not be like the pagans of the region fashioning like golden calves and other things that they would worship uh, and make those the object of their worship. So, the, so I can remember you know, being challenged by my, my Protestant friends growing up who said, well, why don't you have this commandment? Because you all have graven images in your church. And your church doesn't want you to know that you're not supposed to have these things. That's why your commandment is not there. I mean, the graven images commandment is not there. Uh, and then I have to explain as a, a, a third grader, but we don't worship these things that are in our church. We don't worship the statues or the images. They're pictures uh, that remind us of the sacred. We don't worship the saints. That's not idolatry either. Uh, or having a false god. We, we honor them because they worship God and give us an example of what it means to have a, a, a good relationship with God and to, to follow the commandments. Uh, so in the church there has been a, um, a shift in understanding of what these graven images are, that, that we don't worship the image as sacred or, or as a god, but they remind us of that which is sacred, which is God alone, who is holy. And there was a big controversy in the early church, especially in the 7th century, where there were Christians who thought there should not be any statues or artwork or mosaics or icons, especially in the East, uh, uh, because it was the worshipping of uh, graven images. And there was this period in the church during that time called iconoclasm, where Christians went into their churches and stripped them of all their artwork and statuary and pictures and icons and glass, stained glass windows. Everything was stripped and that caused the church to have to call a council of the bishops to decide were the iconoclasts right and is this how we should go or were they wrong and the church sided with uh, those who wanted the images and said uh, that, that iconoclasm was a heresy in the church. Now in, in the Protestant Reformation that will rear its ugly head not so much with Lutherans, but with more with Presbyterians or, or those that followed. Maybe uh, Mark or Buck might know better. Which groups of Protestants went into the churches and really ripped out everything, like altars and statuaries? You, you, you see a lot of that in Anglicanism. Uh, but they have statues now, too, though. But, but the best the best is, yeah. that, that, that actually sort of dates back to the mid-1800s. Mm -hmm. A very strong Puritan element in Anglicanism did that. Okay. Calvin. But I'm thinking of the great cathedrals in Europe that were Catholic and were taken over by certain Puritan groups maybe or Calvinistic groups that they really went in and ripped everything out. Now what's interesting too is since the 1960s after the Second Vatican Council there was kind of a renewal of iconoclasm in the Catholic Church and beautiful churches like ours were stripped. Uh, of artwork and uh, statuary and and beautiful altars and and then things that were not as up to par with in art uh, replace these things and I don't know why that happened but we're constantly facing uh, that sort of uh, of ugly thing. Can I ask you, yes. Stole our Mary. I'm sorry. Somebody stole our Mary. Uh, our Mary is now where she belongs. She's upstairs in the church on a pedestal. Right. If if. If you see where the water fountain is and there's a corner there, mm -hmm. directly above that she's there on a pedestal. Well, I like seeing her well somebody's going to give me another statue she, uh, that's like this, so we may put her down there. Depends on how good she looks. <laughs> no, she's not stolen. She's back where she belongs. I didn't look. I couldn't, I couldn't that, look at it and I couldn't find her. Well, you have to come towards the front because you can't see it if you're at the back of the church because of how it's in that indented area there. But those, that statue of Mary and St. Joseph that we have up there, the painted Joseph, are a pair that probably came together and were in the original uh, church before this one was built. So they're older than any statue that we have in the, in the place. So, so she belongs up there, so we're glad she, we're, in fact we're going to have it restored uh, I shortly. Heard, I heard you were going to say she was on sabbatical. Sabbatical. <laughs> 
Well, you know, when we were renovating the church in, in about five years ago, those big, beautiful angels that we had with the horns, we had to take them out of there uh, because of the work that was being done. And people thought that I had gotten rid of them. I said, no, they're just on vacation. They're in Europe right now. And somebody thought that they were in Europe. I mean, they thought I had sent them to Europe. They were so handsome. <laughs> yeah. um, two things about the, I, the iconoclasts and the, and the statues. Um, one is, as far as the Reformation goes, one thing I, I could be wrong with, the hypocrisy in that is that a lot of people who took those things, they took them for profit. They were gold. They right. Were gold, they, they, they were right. valuable. And so <coughs> they got to hoard them and right. be, they got to be righteous and rich right. at the same time. And then another thing, as far as us having to defend ourselves to Protestants and this all the stuff that we have, um, there is the argument that what we have is very expensive and very grandiose. Yes. And so how do we respond to, to that? Mac might be able to answer that. And that's true not only about what we have, but what the Vatican has, the artwork and all of that. Yeah, Go ahead. There's two, there's two considerations I think we have to look at. Number one, this idea that this beauty is the front of the poor. Uh, I think that's ridiculous. Because this may be the most beautiful thing that a poor person ever sees. And to deny them the beauty or a glimpse of what, or it's supposed to be a glimpse of what heaven might be, to deny that to them is maybe worse off uh, than not them ever seeing it at all. I mean, they don't ever know beauty. Their lives are that drudgery. To be able to take part of their day and to come in and to see something and to experience beauty right. is a great, I think it's a wonderful thing to do for them, okay, uh, to the poor. The second thing is that many of these gifts, if somebody gives something to you, a family member, they give you something very special, and that gift was given to you uh, by your father or your mother or your grandmother, your grandfather, and uh, it was a very special gift. Um, you know, you treat that gift and you pass it on from one generation to the next. Okay? How many times we see, you know, this was your great grandfather's ring or this was your great grandfather passing it to you now as I pass on. And we pass these things on uh, in our family. To sell that would be almost a crime because this expresses more than just you know something to have that, that has you know there's more to it than just a monetary value it has sentimental value and when the church receives a gift the church is saying this is a wonderful special gift that somebody has given to the church to honor God and for the church to sell it would say that your gift, no matter if it was 500 years ago, a thousand years ago, means nothing. <clears throat> and so the church can't sell that because it's ours, okay, as the church. And since we, or our forefathers, built this beautiful church, this money didn't come from anybody, it didn't harm anybody. It was freely given to build this edifice to the glory of God. And it wasn't taking food out of the poor's mouth. <coughs> it wasn't harming. But it gives the poor the opportunity to experience beauty which they would never ever get a chance to, to see. I don't know if that's that. I can answer, yeah. And, and there's a history, too, of you know, preserving history. That's what the Vatican has done with so much of the art and the archives, everything. The church has always been very good at preserving history because history is part of salvation history. That's sacred. History is sacred in the eyes of Jews and, and Christians and that we should preserve our history, yes. <laughs> to God is for his glory and uh, we do that 
look at the Buckingham Palace, look at um, the White House, you know. Mm -hmm. They have, um, you know, um, antique, no. all of that. Um, and then also in the Bible, Jesus had, um, there is a woman that washed Jesus' feet and broke the alabaster jar. So, and then Judas was even mad and said, that could have been given to the poor. But Jesus said, leave her alone. The poor you will always have. And so, so he let, Jesus <coughs> let this woman uh, do it for his glory. So can mm -hmm. we do, can't we do the same thing for him? Okay. Well, it's still though, we just got lectured not to put too much in material things. And, well, and, the, you know, and that's just true, too. Nostalgic value, not right. just material right. value. But. And I'm thinking, you know, that's, that's true, but in terms of the church, we're preserving it. It yeah. depends on why you're keeping something. Uh, you know, we keep a lot of things that we don't need that we could give away. <clears throat> but other things that we have are family treasures that you want to pass on to your and children. Yeah. Keep our family closer. Right, right. right. And, your, and your family history, too, of your family, and your heritage. And, right. and, and this is right. for, for everybody, it's not for individual. Um, right, the, pe the, the people whole. in the world that get exposed to the art at the Vatican are not just Catholics. I mean, they come from all over the world. Well, yes. Right. That the artist did such awesome work, mm -hmm. you know, giving to the giving to the church, <clears throat> but that value didn't really come until later. Later, right? And that we preserved it in the church. Okay. So we're not doing an uh, American Idol here. No. <laughs> <laughs> right. You can't watch American Idol. <laughs> Breaks the second commandment. <clears throat> so. <laughs> okay, Jerry, you have a few words, and I'm going to something for you. Where is it at?